Hey there, everybody. It's Mike Yao with Savage Kingdom's role-playing game and Fire and the Head Productions. Um, this is another video in the series that I promised that I was going to do a couple of videos ago. So the last one was the about the kingdom, the Savage Kingdom of Eridorn, and this one will be about the kingdom of Brithia. So, because we're going in alphabetical order. So if you watched the last one about Eridorn, that lasted about 30 minutes or so. Um, which is what I'm trying to target these things for. And it just kind of went through a basic, uh, uh, and what's kind of already in the core rule book, but I'm also expanding upon it, things that I might not have necessarily written in there, but mostly I'm kind of going over, uh, and just kind of giving some extra insight about what's actually listed in the book, uh, including what player characters get as their, uh, racial abilities, favorite talents, that kind of stuff. If you choose to be a character from Brithia, um, in this case, um, and then some other just kind of insight about the culture as well of Brithia, about Brithian culture, and about the, the gods and religions and that sort of thing, and that sort of thing. So um, we'll go through the, um, I'll try to stick to the same format as I did before. Like, you know, I don't really edit these things. I don't really have time for it, but perhaps one of these days. Uh, so I will try to stick pretty close to the format that I use for the Kingdom of Eridorn. All right, let's get started. Okay, so on page 22 in the core rulebook, we have a uh, table 2-2 master list of playable races. Uh, and in this, the second entry, uh, under Eridornian, is Brithian. Uh, as someone from Brithia, obviously, is a Brithian, a man or, 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 man or woman of Brithia. Uh, the brief description of a Brithian is just one line. It says, known for their seafaring, archery, and tendency to scheming. That's about all I could fit because I was just trying to keep those like one line. Uh, then when you go to the actual um, entry in the uh, character creation chapter, so on page 24, and, the, and I'm going by the hardcover. This is uh, our picture of a, a Brithian archer. Oh, as the pages go flying right there. Uh, it's like a young female archer, which is kind of cool. And um, she represents our Brithian. Um, yeah, so that's on page 24. If you have the PDF, uh, the digital file, I think it's page 25. I think it's off by like a page. So anyway, you'll be in the right area. So I'll read the, uh, the three paragraphs of description for Brithian. Um, so here we go. The people of Brithia, and it's spelled B-R-Y-T-H-I-A, but, uh, it's, the Y is a, it's like a, it's like a, more of a, um, not only Anglo-Saxon, but more of a, a Welsh kind of thing, where it is, is, a, is a vowel. It's not, it's not Brythia, it's Brythia. The people of Brythia are generally tall, lean, fair-skinned, and fair-haired, usually with blue or blue-green eyes. They can be a shrewd lot, nearly rivaling the Laurentians in their ability to scheme and grow empires, considering themselves far more civilized than their neighboring realms. Of late, Brythians have become a sea people, rivaling the Asmondians to the south on the Sunset Sea. For the, for the past two centuries, the Brythians have been ruled by queens, King Alric II being the last male sovereign. The current ruling queen is Elspeth IV, a now elderly woman who is said to wear gilded masks due to the effects of a mysterious disease or curse. Dukes, earls, barons, and lesser lords support her in a crude form of feudalism. The reason is I chose the word crude form of feudalism because, again, it is more of a Dark Ages setting. Um... The feudal age was the time of feudalism, obviously, but I think what look, gets overlooked a lot in history is that way before the feudal age, there actually were forms of feudalism. It just wasn't called that. Uh, so it was all based on oaths sworn to a uh, to a to a, a, a rival or neighboring lord, um, and so then kind of a hierarchy system sort of more or less developed. Uh, it still caused a lot of feuding and stuff, and uh, it makes it very interesting for storytelling when you're doing medieval fantasies, particularly in the Dark Ages. Um, so just a little side note there, that feudalism did really, in, uh, I mean, goes way back to really the Roman Empire, probably before, probably even during the Greek era. Um, the last paragraph of the description, Brithian religion is similar to that of Kimrith and the Emerald Islands with deities such as Brianan, Cormac, Gelrith, Bronfinnan, and Luella, uh, Luella Ravendark. More information about Brithia can be found in Chapter 20, The Savage West. That's the Gazetteer 
chapter. So that's just three paragraphs. Um, I think I mentioned this in the last video, but in the previous uh, core rule books of the previous editions, I made the descriptions uh, longer, but this is up. I decided just to kind of give people just a quick smattering, then get then get to the game statistics and all the stuff that people mostly want. Uh, but if you want more detail, go to the Gazetteer section, uh, like it just said, chapter 20, uh, the Savage West uh, is the name of that chapter. And you can just look up Brithia, and it gives you a lot more detail about the culture, about the languages, about the, the coinage they use, imports, exports, um, VIPs, important characters, you know, NPCs, uh, heraldry, that kind of stuff. So yeah, don't don't breeze over that. There's some really good stuff in there that's great to grasp a hold of for role playing, and it only takes a few minutes to read it. So, all right. So and then after the that little description, allowable calling. So Brithians can be. So, for those of you who don't know, a calling is uh, the closest thing to a class in Savage Kingdoms. Um, I don't really like class-based systems that much because they're too rigid. So, but I do realize that people like some people do like them. So, the calling system—I know I've said this before—is uh, kind of an in-between thing. So, if you choose a calling, it kind of gives you a package of things and like favorable, favored talents and skills uh, and some equipment to start with. So, it kind of gives you a focus. Um, but you don't have to choose a calling at all. You can totally just be sans calling. You don't have to have one. Um, it's probably game mechanically slightly more favorable to have one. Um, but I've still seen a couple people recently not even have a calling. Most people do, but, um, yeah. So allowable callings for Brithians, alchemist, assassin, bard, craftsman, gladiator, healer, hunter, knight, merchant, noble, pirate, priest, sage, seer, Shaman, soldier, sorcerer, thief, and witch. So that's a lot of them. There's 20. Gosh, no, I'm trying to remember. I guess I could count them real quick. I think there's 20. Yeah, there's 20 callings exactly in the core rule book, and there'll be five new ones coming out in the Savage East, so 25 total. Uh, so Brithians have access to, looks like just a rough count, uh, like 15, 14 or 15 of those. So. Uh, so that shows that they're very varied people. Uh, now, somebody's asked me, in the, or a couple of people have asked me in the past, it's like, can you just ignore that and just have any race or class, just choose any calling? Well, of course so, of course so. But these are, um, but if you're really looking at keeping true to the world and trying to uh, create, uh, try to, to template as much as possible and to try to give them a little more flavor to a certain race or class, then I highly suggest you stay with the, the callings. Because otherwise you may get something weird like a, um, let's see, what, what, what's one that's not listed there? Um, gosh, I can't see right which ones are missing. They have so many that I don't see which ones are missing right off. Uh, shaman. No, shaman is even in there. Because you can be a uh, uh, druidism is kind of their main religion, which I'll get to. Um, anyway, doesn't matter. So my point was going to be that, uh, say, if you choose a calling that's not really listed to that culture or race, it just might come off kind of weird. But you know, feel free to do it, uh, individual game masters, if you want to. All right, then their attribute arrays. Um, Brithians are. Um, their starting at attributes are pretty pretty normal. They're more favored ones like Vigor. They can start out with as high as plus four and as low as only minus two. Intellect up to plus four. Magnetism up to plus four, um, which means the minimums are minus two to start with. Um, so those are, yeah, so basically uh, Vigor, Intellect, and Magnetism are kind of like their favored, their main attributes. Whereas agility, physique, and willpower are the sort of the lacking ones, but only by a little bit. So, typical kind of human human thing. So each human um, ethnicity or or um, realm or culture um, has like three different sort of favorite attributes and three that that aren't. But they're only all, they're only different by like one point because. In essence, they're still human. So, okay, special abilities. Brithians get nautical affinity. All Brithian characters receive a plus one bonus to acrobatics, athletics, perception, and sailing skill rolls while aboard any vessel at sea. Uh, even if you even if you're from inland, you still uh, because obviously Brithia is more than just a coastal area. Uh, but that is kind of one of its sort of main things. So you would get that regardless uh, if the game master decides to give you some other racial ability instead. That's uh, again, that's totally on that person. So that's, that's fine and dandy, but generally speaking, you would have nautical affinity. Even if you grew up, say a hundred miles inland 
in, in like Eastern Brithia or whatever. Uh, the second special ability they get is Urban Affinity. Brithians gain a plus one bonus to all acrobatics, perception, persuasion, and stealth skill rolls while within the confines of any settlement numbering 2,000 or more inhabitants. And that's to reflect that Brithia does have a number of fairly good sized cities, um, such as Corrington, um, uh, Saxford, uh, there's a couple of others. Uh, Corrington is the capital. Um, something's supposed to go pumping. Like, just appearing randomly on my screen. Okay, there we go. There's a Norton thing. Um, probably have to, to uh, update it. So, um, yeah, so that's the two kind of special racial abilities. So every human culture gets kind of two of these sort of little special abilities. Um, and then you get skill specialties, like any other human, uh, and some of the non-humans as well. Brithian characters receive three free skill specialties of character creation that help reflect Brithian culture and virtues. So I won't read all of those, kind of like with Aerodorn, I kind of skim, skim through a little bit. But just to give you a quick example, um, let's say melee weaponry. They, their specialties you can choose from is flail, great sword, long sword, spear, or hammer. Range weaponry, longbow, or light crossbow. Let me grab another one. Sailing is uh, you can specialize in boats, river barges, or sailing ships. Um, I know boat sounds kind of broad, but I'm using boat in the somewhat more traditional sense where a boat is a smaller vessel and a ship is a greater vessel so that's kind of what that means um perception coastal urban or sea uh, athletics blacksmithing carpentry ships uh, weaponry and there's other choices as well but i just wanted to grab a few examples right there and then they have favorite talents like all um human racial entries so uh i'm not going to list all those because there's a lot of them you can find them again on page 24 and 25 uh but there's a pretty good bit of battle talents that they they uh, they are uh, mostly a warrior people. They are a warrior race. They're getting more civilized. So a, a good way to think of Brithia in real world terms is uh, I base them off of um, their Anglo-Saxon. So before, just before it became well, or right at the point where it became a united uh, a united England. So you had all these small smaller kingdoms like Mercia, uh, Mercia and. Uh, uh, Essex and Wessex and um, uh, what was the one in Northumbria and, the, and places like that. So just when they were kind of getting to that part of the Dark Ages, really becoming a united England is kind of what I based Brithian, uh, Brithia on. So um, the word Brithia is supposed to kind of conjure Britain, Britannia. That's on purpose. Um, and then I put, I made it a Y to kind of remind people that there's a little bit of a, a Celtic, Gaelic, Kimric kind of grounding to that culture. And that's why the Cairns and the Brithians kind of share a very similar religious thing. And they have Druids as kind of their main priests. So a little side note right there. That might be interesting. All right. So, um, so the original point is that they are still kind of a warrior people. They are getting, you know, more and more quote civilized unquote. Uh, but, but still, um, that means they're, they're still, you know, more or less a warrior race. Uh, blood talents that are favored. She-blooded and troll-born. At least list those. There's only two of them. Uh, the mystical talents. Um, Acolyte of the Druidic Order. Cultist, Dabbling Arcanist, and Grimoire. Grimoire. Social talents. They have a pretty good bit of favored social talents. They are a pretty uh, social, and they can be a scheming, catty sort of people at times. Subterfuge, uh, yeah, a few of those other talents, so yeah, fair to decent amount. And then we go to favorite weaknesses. I'll list those actually. Um, enemy, gaius slash taboo, illegitimate, infamous, oath bound, oath breaker, obsession of ale, wine, uh, ale, wine, or the sea, too tall, and waif. So those are their favorite weaknesses, meaning that if you choose one, one of those as, uh, as a weakness, you gain a bonus point. So, uh, in other words, that those those the Brithians are kind of known to maybe lean towards those kind of weaknesses, just like they are known to, to lean towards those favored uh, strengths or, or talents that I listed before. Starting languages: Brithian is your native tongue, and you also know one of the following if your intellect is minus one or better: Carnian, Kimrethi, Ismondian, Garnic, and Norish. So. Uh, yeah, so Brithian is uh, Brithian would be considered the common tongue of the north of northern Estonia. There is no common tongue overall in Savage Kingdoms. I, I tried to make the 
setting. I hate to use realism because it's fantasy, but a little more grounded, a little more believable. Um, so there's not really a widespread common tongue. Uh, there is a side note, at, the, at least in the previous edition, an optional rule that if you want to make a common tongue, then obviously go for it. Please do it. Um, so, and Brithian is kind of a common tongue of northern Astagonia, like most of the peoples of the realms in the north, uh, unless you're in really far northern uh, Norland, or maybe even far northern, uh, well, definitely in far north, or even in central Scathia, maybe even southern Scathia. Um, you might not know it then. The Thracians definitely wouldn't know it. Uh, Malovians are kind of hit and miss with knowing Brithian. If you're from southern Malovia, you would probably know it. Um, if you're from northern Laurentia, you would probably speak Brithian, but anything south of, say, the northern provinces of the Laurentian Empire uh, or south of Ismondos, you almost certainly wouldn't know Brithian unless you have it as a bonus language and a good reason in your character to you know, maybe have gift of the tongues, maybe you, uh, your intellect is you have several levels of language and you get to choose another one. Uh, hopefully, story-wise, you come up with a reason why. You know, did you learn it from a book? Did you learn it from the feet of a mentor? Did, did you happen to travel there for a few months and, you know, so, yeah, a little note to that about languages. Um, so, Carinian was an option as a bonus language. That's the uh, Scotland-like province, which I'll cover in the next video. Uh, that's loose basically on Scotland. So, that's Carinia, or Carindon, as they prefer to call it. But Carinia is usually what uh, the province, the Brithians, call it, is that. So, um, Kim Rethi is another bonus language option if your intellect is minus one or better. Uh, you get these automatically if your intellect is, is minus one or better, or one of those. Kimrethi is uh, based on Kimric or, or uh, Celtic Welsh. Ismondian, which is, you know, the language of Ismondos. Uh, Garenic is the, the language of all the, the Emerald Isles. Um, and Norish is another option, which is the kingdom to the north, a very Viking-type realm. Okay, sample names of Brithians. All right, starting with the male ones. Aethelwald, Egbert, Eomund, Garen, Kenric, Osric, and Willem. So those are all, I actually happen to really kind of like Anglo-Saxon names. I know some people think they're kind of weird because they're so, a lot of them are kind of far removed from modern names, which is why I like them. Um, but there's a few, like Kenric, you might kind of hear that, or, or a surname. Uh, Osric, maybe Willem certainly is, you know, now William. So, uh, but I think Aethelwald is really cool. That's a very, Aethel was a very, uh, is a prefix you see in a lot of Anglo-Saxon names. I think it means great, or, or king, great king, Aethelwald might actually be great king. Anyway, no, that's kidding. Anyway, Egbert, um, Eomund, and Garen. No, Eomund is kind of cool because it ends in uh, Mund, M-U-N-D, which is a very, a northern name, but it's also Anglo-Saxon, and Eo is, um, you see it in actual Anglo-Saxon a little bit, but it's also kind of a shout out to the, a lot of the naming schemes of Rohan that Tolkien chose, where Eo means horse. So Eo Mund, I think, means something like horse lord. So just interesting side notes, maybe interesting, maybe not. And then the female uh, sample names would be Alyssa, Bettina, Britelda, Egbertha, Ingva, Marion, and Wilma. So Wilma is just the, uh, the female uh, form of William or Wilma or Willem. So yeah, those are kind of cool. Um, interesting. I didn't list Elspeth there as the queen's name. So probably should have. Brithians typically use son of and daughter of naming schemes or place or occupational names. Noble houses, however, often produce surnames or members for members of that family. So to, to, bas to basically sum up what this is, uh, so they're usually, their names might be Egbert, son of Osric. Uh, but a lot of times, if they're from a, a settlement that is kind of known, like Corrington or Saxford or Five Roads or uh, Edinglaz, one of those uh, more notable settlements in Brithia, then you might be known as, as uh, Eomen of, of Edinglaz or something like that. And then if you were a noble uh, uh, nobility, you would typically, uh, particularly well-known, a higher nobility, you might have a noble house, like you would have a, uh, which is where surnames came from, where last names came from. So in that case, you might be... Uh, Marion um, Silverhawk. Probably not. I used Silverhawk as an example in the last video with Eridorn because the High King's uh, name is uh, Silverhawk is his surname, his house name. Um, let's see, what's, a, what's some Brithian ones? I actually have them right here. Whiteheart um, is one. So, yeah. So, Ingva Whiteheart could be your name if you're of noble. Uh, now, you could also have earned a Kenning 
which is more of a Scandinavian term, but it also applies to Anglo-Saxon uh, or Brithian in this case. A kenning is a uh, is is almost like a title, a descriptive, and an, an epithet. So, like uh, Osric the Archer, or Osric the Slayer, or Willem the Black, or Willem the, the Red Bearded, or something like that. So, you could also do that. And then the culture item: Brithian characters may begin play with one or two by spending a point of luck of the following cultural items, items in addition to the more normal gear they might purchase. So every culture has this. Uh, I'll just go through them really quick because we're at 20 minutes. Exceptional quality, uh, exceptional quality leather and wood quiver helps prevent rust and spilled arrows. Two mastercrafted arrows, it's plus one to armor piercing and maximum damage, 75% chance retrieval. So there's a 25% chance that it breaks or you can't find it. Exceptional quality fur trimmed cloak, plus one to endurance rolls to resist cold when worn. Signet ring with heraldic device. Yours if highborn, some other lords if not. This is sort of my Brithian accent, by the way. Poor quality longbow, needed, needing repair. Crafting deal 20 to repair to average quality. Bronze or copper torque, captured from an enemy warrior, plus one to renown when worn. A, court, a torque for those, some of you probably already know this, most of you probably do actually. A torque is this cool Celtic neck ring. I actually have one. And I should probably go get it, but I don't want the video to take too much longer than it should. But this is cool. It has like wolf heads, like dragon wolf heads in the end, and it's kind of spiraled. Anyway, it's a, it's a fairly well-known piece of uh, Celtic jewelry that kind of spread even into like the Vikings as well. Um, cold iron dagger does more harm to fairy creatures than fireforged iron or steel. So yeah, we're using, in Savage Kingdom, we we're using that whole uh, cold iron lore that it kind of harms fairies or at least uh, makes it more painful for, to them. Uh, in this case, to be more clear, because some of that lore is uh, it seems referring to like any kind of metal, particularly steel. And then some of the older lore, which is what I lean towards, is that cold iron is literally what it is, like uh, uh, iron that hasn't been touched by fire. So to make cold iron means you, you can't use forge fire, so you have to be really strong. You have to bend all this stuff. So for some reason, that's harmful to um, fairies. Uh, legend has it that perhaps in the other world, things, uh, weapons aren't. Uh, either iron doesn't exist or wep weapons are never made that way, and so that's why it's extra harmful to uh, people of uh, fairy or fey origin or der derivation. Okay, uh, three cold iron tipped arrows, extra harm to fairies, uh, fairy creatures just like with a dagger, 50% chance of retrieval, and the last possible item that you could choose to start with is a one-half ownership of a galley or small sailing ship kept in a Brithian port. I've seen that actually come in a lot. A lot of people don't choose that, but the couple, I think a couple times I've seen it chosen, it's come into play and is, was really cool. Because, quick side note, as a game master, I love when players enterprise and they come up, they use things, and often it's little hints and things that I've given them, either with their equipment or like lore or rumors they've heard. And they go, oh my god, that's right, I have a sh my family has a ship in Corrington, I, it's 150 miles away, it's a long ride, but it's better than trying to buy a ship, or buy passage, and perhaps it's still, and so, perhaps it's available. Um, and the one-half ownership keeps them from having full ownership, because it's a lot of money's worth of ship, and that means they always have it. So one-half also gives it a story reason, there's a 50% chance that it's not that the other owner is has it out of port, is using it maybe sold it. So again, all these story ideas can be created just from this one little thing. All right, their general code of honor. Honor and obey the queen and the royal court, and to a lesser extent, all Brithian nobles. Do not suffer a pirate to live, especially an Asmondian or Norish one. Give pardons to Brithian privateers, for they are charged with hunting true pirates. Avenge serious insults by single combat, public apology, or acceptance of gifts. Protect and honor all family members demanding wear guild for any slain unjustly. So some of you more historian people probably know what wear guild means. It literally means man gold um, in Anglo-Saxon. Um, and it kind of bled over into some uh, some Viking use as well. But wear guild really is actually Anglo-Saxon. It, it literally means man gold. And that means uh, the price of a man's life. So... Um, that's why it says protect and honor all family, family members demanding wear guild for any slain unjustly. So if you were to slay uh, another Brithian or even perhaps even another person not from Brithia that you kind of respect to your level, then that um, you might assume that you need to pay pay wear guild. In other words, man gold. How much is the is uh, is their gold price worth? 
to society. So if you killed a champion warrior unjustly, particularly if you murdered him or some way, you know, well, there's other repercussions for that, but you might could be able to get away with just paying wear guild to the family. Uh, that might be the hundred to 200, 250 silver pieces or, you know, 20 to 50 gold pieces. In other words, um, whereas killing just a farmer, I didn't say they just because even the farmer had a pretty decent amount because you know, this is somebody who supplies food for the tribe or for the clan. Uh, his, his, his or her wear guild may only be like 20, 25 silver. But um, anyways, the idea that uh, human life is, uh, is it literally has a value for uh, like a gold or silver value for it. So that's what wear guild means. All right. And um, I think, I think that's about it. We're at 25 minutes, but I feel like there's some things from the Eridornian one I haven't covered. Um, all right, so I'm going to... Uh, oh, yeah, I know what I did in the last one. So I'm going to go to the Brithia section of the Savage West, which is just the fancy name for the Gazetteer chapter. And I think there's a couple things I need to cover there. That's, that's probably what I'm lacking. So just a moment as I flip to that page, unedited as always. All right, so Eridorn, Brithia, that's Athalon, that is a Pridonian island. All right, so here's Brithia. There's a nice map of it. So in the Gazetteer chapter, so it was Brithian, Brithia, actually. So that is the uh, general map of Brithia, as you can see. Um, so some quick notes about Brithia that I haven't mentioned yet. Let's see, primary imports, wood, wine, foodstuffs, herbs, Spices, fine cloth, gold, silver, precious gems, wool, leather goods, alchemical goods. I actually kind of forgot about the alchemical good ones. Primary exports, horses, cattle, iron, tin, bronze, copper, pearl, semi-precious gems, clayware, tileware, and sea goods. So that's what they tend to kind of mostly make. And, um, coinage, coinage and currency of the kingdom of Brithia. Uh, oh, wait. Sorry. I just read from Athlon, which is a Pridonian island. Pridonian Isle. So ignore that last 45 seconds. Uh, so actual Brithian imports. I thought those sounded weird, especially with the alchemy stuff. Actual Brithian primary imports. Exotic woods, silver, copper, iron, precious gems, exotic stone, fine cloth, ivory, horses, cattle, and perfumes. That's what they like to import, which makes sense because those are kind of exotic not particularly known to kind of a temperate uh, sort of Western environment. Primary exports. So this is the stuff they tend to make the most and they would, you know, have access to, you know, ex they export it because there's like surplus. Ships, pine wood, hardwood, gold, tin, semi-precious gems, crystal, leather goods, sheep, foodstuffs, sea goods, and herbs. So there you go. So as you can see, fairly wealthy kingdom when you can export gold and uh, semi-precious stones and crystal and stuff like that. Uh, all right. What is your currency? I'll just do this in really quick. Brithian mint, uh, Brithia mints and stamps its own coins, which must be approved by the queen or one of her assigned agents. Although trade and barter in the country is still fairly prevalent, particularly in kind of the more rural areas. The most common bronze coin of the realm is called a hundry. Hundry, like based on hundred, hundred or hundredth. The silver coin, a silver tenth, and the gold piece, a crown or gildan. I think in Eridor they're called gildans, and that's why sometimes at Brithia they're called gildans, but specifically also known as a crown. So uh, a hundred, a silver silver tenth, and a crown or gildan. Uh, let's see, Brithia's weather tends to be kind of like England in a way, so I def definitely kind of went that way. It, gets, it can be very foggy, uh, pretty rainy at times. It snows a decent amount, particularly in the north. Uh, but the summers can be uh, quite quite nice, particularly in southern Brithia. Uh, right, let's see. Common customs. I don't want to go into that. Oh, yeah, religion I think I missed out on. All right, so the uh, – I, actually, I touched on it a little bit earlier. So the typical Brithian reveres still the old gods of the Druids, the shamanic priests of the original Garnic and Gwynic peoples. In other words, the gods Briannon, Cormac, Gelrith, Bronfinnan, Luella Ravendark, or just uh, Luella, and more. The reason it says more, so a lot of, I think some people get confused that that's literally the only five gods of the West. That's clearly untrue. Those are just kind of the five known, like the big five, kind of like the, uh, in real life, the, the Nordic pantheon. We, we know of Freya and Freya and Odin and Thor and Loki. Um, 
but evidence shows that there were there were a lot more kind of smaller and minor local gods that we either don't know the names of anymore. Actually, there are a few more like Balder. There's a few others that left off, uh, or just names lo- uh, lost to history, um, or they were just never written down in runes. So, so keep that in mind. That is the case here also. Uh, all right. So, yet some northern influences trickle down, and some Brithians occasionally find themselves cursing or praying to Fragner, Signa, and other Norish deities. Eastern Brithians on occasion have come to accept St. Paladir of the Eridornians. So he's the lone true god of, of Eridorn that I covered in the last, to some small degree, in the last video. All right. Uh, notable characters really quick. Queen Elspeth is by far the most renowned personage in all of Brithia, an, age, an aging woman that some say wears a bronze mask to hide a deformity. Yet there are also such high-born folk as Duke Colton of Corrington, Lord Sir Elred of Castle Rune, the arch druidess and sorceress Igrana the Grey, and the famous commoner Sir Ostrich the Archer. Right. Uh, heraldry, really quick. Heraldry, the primary standard of Brithia is that of a golden ship on a blue field, long stand, a long-standing symbol, although it pertains mainly to Corrington and the royal house. A blue seahawk upon a golden field is also associated with Duke Colton, and a green harp on a field of silver or white represents the emerald harp, often fairly prevalent across the realms. So, nice little side note there. Yeah, I think that might actually do it at 31 minutes. Not bad at all. Um, oh, wait, I want to end with this because I like these uh, common sayings of uh, people from Brithia. Gelrith, Lady of Storms and the Sea, take this offering. Never suffer a pirate to live. The fair folk must be appeased. May the queen's gaze fall not upon you. To be a Kimrethi is to sleep with dogs. To be a Brithian is to sleep with gods. Right. So those are some of the common sayings of the land of Brithia and Brithians in general. So, all right. Hopefully that was helpful for those of you who are playing Brithian characters who are thinking about possibly playing a Brithian character. Or if you're a game master who has to play or has played or wants to play Brithian non-player characters. So there you go. Hopefully you've learned a little bit and you've enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe. Please like and you know check these out. Like them if you want. It really it really helps. I know it sounds like like please like my stuff. Uh, which is great, but it's really not about that. It helps the algorithm. Plus I want to know if it's worth doing this. I'm, I'm a pretty busy dude like a lot of us so want to know some of these things are worth it. So um, hopefully, I think, seems like some of these are kind of catching on. I'm getting more views from some of this stuff. Uh, check out the live plays as well. Those are kind of fun. Um, yeah, they're kind of long, but, you know, you don't have to watch the whole thing. Keep them in the background. So thanks for checking the video out, guys, and I will check you out. The next one I will do will be on the kingdom or really the province of Carnia. So stay tuned. I'll talk to you then.